<laughs> and now, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our guest speakers, Joan Whitecalf and Christy Harcourt, who will talk to us about hosting and producing Gaywire, CJSR FM 88.5 long running LGBTQ radio program. Please proceed. Thank you. Hi, hi, everybody. I'm just going to jump in, Christy. <laughs> I'm putting in. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Jan, for the opportunity to take part in the Aging with Pride series. Uh, I've learned that Aging with Pride is a real thing. <laughs> it's an actual real thing, and it is helping me to uh, navigate what it means to be a senior out lesbian. Um, it's been quite an adventure. Uh, there's been a reoccurring theme uh, running throughout it and that's to stand up to homophobia and I'll shatter all the myths that come with it. Um, part of the uh, adventure has included uh, offering a gay and lesbian support group some time ago that ran for two years in Camrose in the late 80s. And uh, we relied on print media and word of mouth uh, to you know, make it accessible to anyone that might be struggling with their sexual orientation. Um, I felt uh, our visibility as a support group needed to expand and uh, I went to the local uh, cable TV station to put an ad out. Um, they quickly told me that they absolutely could not have the words gay and lesbian on the TV screen ever. <laughs> uh, so uh, sometime after that, uh, I moved back to the big city of Edmonton where I was born, but I'd never lived uh, as I had grown up in mostly rural, all rural, rural places in Alberta. Uh, and I could not believe my ears one day uh, as I heard this lovely voice, a uh, self-proclaimed lesbian talking on the radio. Uh, the program consisted of, you know, music celebrating all things queer. And uh, a favorite segment of mine was global current affairs dealing with the issues of the queer community. Uh, the show was like a beacon. <laughs> in the night signaling to me. Uh, I just, I knew I wanted to be a part of it. I didn't know how, but uh, I was going to get on that show. And lo and behold, I became a volunteer with Christy Harcourt. <laughs> Take it away, Christy. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Joan. That's lovely. Um, uh, so I'm Christy Harcourt. I um, I was a host and producer of Gay Wire for 12 years, uh, from 1995 to 2007. I retired, and when, when I retired, we threw a retirement show, and we figured out that we had done 600 weeks or 600 episodes of Gay Wire. Um, Sometimes it felt like about 200 too many. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you get into a volunteer commitment, some of you will be familiar with this, and then you try to replace yourself. It can be hard to get out. Um, and so setting a retirement date and uh, uh, the my retirement was timed around adopting my daughter um, that we kind of had to we had to pick these things. And so, um, yeah, so I was involved in this show then. Um, and but I first heard Gay Wire in um, when I was in the twelfth grade, um, in either late eighty nine or early nineteen ninety. I'm forty nine, um, and I I would walk my dog, and I picked up I, I knew CJSR. I knew people who volunteered there. My brother volunteered there for a bit, and so I was listening to my um, my walk person, which was a relabeled Walkman cassette radio but it was a walk person and so I was listening to my walk person and I was uh, walking around and I heard Adam and Eve which was the feminist show that was on at 5 30 
And then I heard Gay Wire. And one of the things that was really memorable for me was the soap opera that aired on Gay Wire in the late 80s called Lavender Towers. It was a, a soap opera about the um, very intermingled sex and relationship lives of a group of um, of queer people who lived in an apartment building in Oliver. And, um, and I just thought Lavender Towers was amazing. Um, and it had the like it had like theme music and it had like you know on the next episode what will happen with you know robert and sheila um and so that was something that was really really amazing and and similar this kind of sense that something could exist we were talking just before we um opened the room about the advertising thing that joan mentioned which was you know um that actually being able to advertise um, community events and, um, on CJSR and doing in-kind advertising was a really important economy, I think, in the community. Um, Gaywire has existed since the 70s. And so it is, uh, we said the longest running show on CJSR, but it was the longest running show on CJSR when I left. And it was, we think, the longest running radio show in Edmonton. I think so. And it still exists. This is another important thing. I think that there might be hosts of Gaywire here. I don't know if you can, if there are, if they can do a little um, wave response. Um, but I know that they're planning to tune in. So Gaywire is now a podcast. It's still broadcast on CJSR by a, like a, an amazing group of young producers. Um, so it's something that, that still exists. Um, so Joan, do you want to talk a little bit about um, like what it was like, um, what the show was like or what it was like producing it, putting you it bet. together? You bet. Um, first of all, it was a lot of fun. I couldn't believe I was on the radio. I, it was always amazing to me, but uh, there were two shows actually that uh, really stand out in my memory. Um, you know, there was a lot of news coverage at the time uh, that uh, it was, uh, there were issues coming out about gay parenting and uh, followed by the burning question, should they be allowed, you know? So uh, custody of the children, you know, custody of their children were, was being challenged in the courts. And um, uh, I had actually, faced this threat myself as a younger person, uh, stepping away from um, a traditional 10 year marriage. So uh, on my journey towards coming out, it, it, it had been a real threat to me. So um, at that time, my son uh, was in university and my daughter was just finishing uh, senior high school. So I asked them if they would be willing to come on gay wire and talk about their experiences of having an activist lesbian mom and they agreed uh, so they came on the show and they both spoke so eloquently uh, about their experiences of being raised in such a household um, they they summed it up by saying that it was a very positive experience and that they had uh, a real appreciation of what it meant to be different and also how uh, discrimination affects people's lives. Uh, and just a little bit of a bragging moment here. They went on to finish university, paid off their student loans. They put themselves through school and have amazing careers. <laughs> so blah, <laughs> blah, blah, blah on those people. Um, the second show that stands out for me in my time on Gaywire was uh, spurred by a conversation uh, amongst a group of lesbian friends of mine on my 50th birthday. And uh, we were wondering, uh, as members of the queer community, what our lives might be like as seniors. We sort of never really thought about it. And turning 50 kind of spurred, <laughs> spurred the conversation towards that very thing. Uh, our biggest concern at the time seemed to be uh, that we would be assimilated back into uh, the straight society that had been so discriminatory to us in the past. So with uh, Christy's help, uh, we went on to do a show uh, about aging in the queer community. And we invited uh, a lesbian friend to be a guest. And she spoke about her concerns and hopes 
uh, for her and her partner as they aged. And it was another amazing show. Um, and now uh, I'm so grateful to be at this place on my ongoing adventure. Uh, I find myself surrounded by a large community now of uh, brilliant people who are on a mission to address this very issue. Um, what will our lives be like and how will we be treated as aging members of the LGBTQ2S plus community? Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, there are plans now in place addressing this very thing. Um, we were talking about what our concerns are and our needs for safety and uh, dignity and beauty. And there are plans for an actual building, a physical building to um, be built so that we have a place to live. And uh, we are putting on a new concept of um, the face of old folks home. And I think that would be also another topic some time for the radio, an old folks home in the new age. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was thinking about some memorable shows and one of, the, one of the things that I was thinking about as we were getting ready to talk was how the technology changed over the time that I was there and, and over the, the longer period. So when I started working on GayWire, we used reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And if any of you ever edited reel-to-reel -reel tapes, you know that means cutting the tape and taping it to the next part of the tape. Um, and uh, and so that was a uh, real learning. Um, we then, we moved to cassette tapes, to digital editing, um, mini disc recorders, so many different kinds of technology and and I kind of imagine like what it would be like now to record something on your phone email it to yourself and be able to play it on the radio like the the idea that that's that's a smooth transition of information and not you know days of editing and like the idea like the first time I had to cut the tape I remember being so scared that that was that was not going to work um um, uh, Joan mentioned hearing the global news, and so we had this news service um, called This Way Out. It came from, I think it came from Los Angeles. It came by cassette tape in the mail. So it was always a week late, and we would joke that, like, it's still news to us. Nobody else is talking about any of the issues on this tape. So it didn't matter if it was a week or two old because, you know, it was it was news to us. Um, and so we would play this This Way Out news, and I remember learning about um, about so many interesting ways that um, that gender and sexuality were seen in different cultural contexts. Um, there were frequently stories. One thing that comes to mind is there were frequently stories about um, about how like you could discredit a politician by suggesting they were gay, and there were certain countries where that happened all the time. It seemed like we were always hearing that somebody was being discredited through a through a gay rumor, and that was unseating government. Um, so, so that was interesting. Um, for me, um, a couple of episodes that were really notable. One, one was like um, my one of the only kind of actual famous person interviews that I ever got to do was with Dan Savage, who had a sex advice column in C Magazine for many years, uh, like from Seattle, but it was carried in C Magazine. And he happened to be here. So CJSR, like CKUA, does fund drives or um, like a week of the year where you just beg for money. You just do any kind of tap dancing you can do to get people to call in and pledge money. Um, and so it turned out that Dan Savage was going to be here doing a public talk during our fun drive show. And we were broadcasting. Normally, we broadcast from Bank Vault. That's an important thing to know about CJSR Radio. The actual recording studio, broadcast studio, is the old CIBC Bank Vault in the basement of the Students' Union building at the U of A. So like eight-inch thick steel door. Um, you don't ever want to get stuck in there. It's happened over the years. Um, so um, we weren't in the bank vault. We were in Hub Mall in this fairly public area. And what I remember about it is that um, I learned that the word toque is not internationally understood. Um, that it is called a beanie in the States where Dan Savage comes from. And because we were giving away a toque, a CJSR toque, if you pledged, and he kept making jokes that we were giving away toques um, of pot. And I remember thinking, 
we're going to get taken off the, and then he kept just like talking like a sex advice columnist. And um, I just remember looking at the station manager thinking, this is going to be the last show of Gay Wire. This is going to be the day. This is going to be the end. They're going to make me write a really big apology. And like, it was a fun show, but also it felt dangerous. Um, I'd say another show that was really meaningful for me. Um, I can tell you what world events happened on a Thursday uh, because um, it was always a really important thing to try to get it ready for the radio. And the Vreen decision came on April 2nd, 1998, which was a Thursday. And we knew the day before that it was going to be coming. I remember waking up early that morning and sitting in my living room and listening to the CBC news. We didn't know what the answer was gonna be, but we knew it was gonna be announced that day and that there was going to be a rally at the legislature. And so I got to leave my office job where I worked as the secretary and um, get down to the ledge um, for five o'clock, which is when the protest was. And I got to stay for half an hour. And then I walked across the high level bridge to CJSR. And Megan Perry, who is a, um, a podcast producer who worked for many years for CBC Radio in Toronto and Winnipeg, um, stayed at the ledge and interviewed people and was um, calling things into us. And um, so I remember that show. I remember some of the things I remember about that was seeing um, many of the other volunteers and staff from CJSR, many an, a, an uncharacteristically large number of which were young white men, straight men, um, and um, seeing that they all were at the ledge too uh, was a, a very important visible allyship to me, um, that it wasn't just that, that Gay Wire was interested, but that this was something that there was an attachment to from like straight guy colleagues was really meaningful to me. Um, and, and then I just remember having to walk away from it. Like it was such a fun event and it was so big. And then walking away across the bridge and still being able to hear it to like speed walk to get to the Students' Union building to broadcast. Um, so that's a, a day that's really clear in my memory. Um, uh, something that is funny about having been on the radio at a time when there were not a lot of visible LGBTQ people is um, that people would recognize my voice in public. And that's weird. When that happens, it's weird. Um, and so I would be browsing at Orlando Books and somebody would say, I know, or somebody would say, I know your voice, or they would say, you sounded, I liked that thing you did the other night or something like that. And it was always like a very weird thing. And I had no game, no game at all. I was not able to translate any of that into any F date ever in 12 years. No, no ability at all to turn it into anything like conversion rate zero. Um, and so uh, that is a thing that I can tell you that like you can become a little bit better known, doesn't make you any cooler or any more able to do anything. Um, it did um, let me meet amazing people. Um, so um, many, you know, there are so many people I know who um, came on Gay Wire to read their um, poetry or their writing, who wanted to share important stories from the community, who, um, who performed live music. We had lots of people who came and performed live music. Um, we at least two times hosted Christmas pageants, live concerts that then were played on the radio um, with local musicians and, and storytellers. Um, and so some of those pieces are, are like still really, really precious. I'm curious, is there anybody here? And if you can do a react. So if you wanted to hit the reactions, which is the smiley face at the bottom of your screen, and um, do a little wave, or if you just want to wave, if you have your camera on, if you ever were on Gay Wire. A couple of people were on Gay Wire. Some people might be looking for it. Um, Michael was on Gay Wire. I think uh, Eric probably was on Gay Wire. Some, some others of you might have been um, over the years. I also want to say that Gay Wire was always a really big team. So when I started, some of the people, um, Brian and Lenore were two of the hosts, Todd Janes, Keith King, Tam Gorzalka, Chris Samuel um, are some of the many people who, um, who were on Gay Wire over its years. Um, one of the other things that was really 
really neat about Gay Wire is that it would, um, we did collaborations with other shows. And sometimes we did those collaborations through great planning. And sometimes we did those collaborations because somebody didn't show up for a shift. Uh, like it was the full range. Um, CJSR for a long time had um, slogans that related to flying by the seat of your pants. Um, we put the S back in hit, things like that. So sometimes things were a bit chaotic at CJSR. Um, and so, but we did some collabs that were pretty neat. We did collaborations with Adam and Eve, which was the before show neighbor for many years, a feminist show. Um, we did collabs with, um, later on, um, Youth Menace, a show about youth criminal justice issues, was the show before Gay Wire. And we did some really interesting collaborations with Youth Menace uh, related to um, queer and trans youth who were impacted by the criminal justice system, who were impacted by crime. Um, and we did uh, a really interesting series involving um, a hate crime impacting a gay man in Edmonton uh, who was uh, assaulted by someone who was a young offender. And we took part in and recorded a community conferencing um, event where that person got to talk about the impact of their of the assault. Um, the assault occurred at the Pride Awards at a public event at City Hall. Some of you may remember that. Um, and um, the uh, so there was this public, um, uh, like in private, but then broadcast uh, conversation about what had happened, about the impact of this hate crime on the person who was targeted and about some of the impacts uh, on the person who perpetrated the crime um, that were really um, something that I don't think anybody else was doing. Something that's interesting about, about um, things like gay wire, about podcasts, about zines and, and uh, LGBTQ publications is that um, that it was these were these were places where stories about us were centered. Like Joan, when Joan, when you talked about the ways that people talked about adoption or parenting, it was yeah, you're absolutely right. It was a like, should we let them? What are the dangers? Um, was the mainstream approach, and so it was a very different thing to present interviews and culture in a way that says we exist, we're important. Um, and we're here, located in your in this region, and um, and we're going to talk about what the dynamics are like, rather than the pros or cons. Um, and that's a very different thing that I think is more available now than it used to be. Um, Joan, did you ever get recognized? Uh, I was not so much because my. Uh, I was going to school actually uh, it spurred uh, a real interest being on the show it spurred my interest to get into audiovisual communication so I was in school I went to school at Graham McEwen for that afterwards but uh, nobody that was traveling in my circle at the time ever listened to K-Wire <laughs> so you know I was working in home care and all kinds of things at the time so uh Nobody really, I had to, I, but I told everyone. Okay. <laughs> I made sure that they knew. <laughs> it, it's funny because sometimes it felt like nobody was listening. For sure, there were nights that were like, we could, maybe we could say anything. Yeah. Um, because maybe actually literally nobody is listening. That's a possibility. Yeah. Sometimes the people who were listening um, uh, responded in ways that were really touching so we would somewhere in a box in my garage I have some letters that we got from teenagers who wrote letters and put them in the mailbox um, to send to us uh, not just teenagers but mostly um, talking about what they liked about the show and what it was like to be able to hear it and how they would like there was better reception in the barn or they could get it in the in the car you know like how they were how they were hearing us um, so that felt neat um, sometimes people called who were scary um, I remember talking to, um, uh, I remember there was a person who, uh, we did a show, I think we maybe did a show related to December 6th and gun control. And, um, we had, um, 
somebody who persistently would call and talk about teaching me how to shoot so I could develop an appreciation for guns, which I think actually was meant faithfully. It wasn't, wasn't a great experience for me, but I think, I don't think it was meant to be menacing. Um, I remember I've lived in this house for almost 20 years now. And I remember very soon after we moved in, I was standing in the kitchen and the phone rang and somebody I didn't know was calling to talk to me about something that had been on the radio. And I remember like sitting down and feeling like a little bit exposed, like, you know, and it felt like a little bit like it, it, it again, I think it was probably very innocent and um, but it just felt like, oh, right. People can just look you up and, get your number and call you that felt a bit strange um but uh but definitely was a a different kind of experience um so i'm just gonna make a, a little note here um yeah um so yeah so those are some of the the kinds of experiences that we had i i would be really open to opening conversation and and um, I have a few questions for you, if that's something we can try. What I will ask is that we remember that there's a bunch of people who might want to chat, and so that we moderate our space, if that sounds okay. So if um, if it feels like there's other folks wanting to chat, and there's somebody who's, who's taken up a lot of room, we're going to give you a notice for muting. Does that sound all right? We agree to those terms? Okay, that sounds really good. So um, I'm wondering um, how you found out about LGBTQ events or stuff, particularly before internet. What are some of the methods that you had to find out what was going on? And you can add information in the chat or you can unmute yourself and tell us what were some of the ways that you accessed information. Uh, Jan said woman space. So the, the newsletter. Yeah, uh, Michael. Um, I was going to say through, um, through gate, uh, through the bars, which would have list up. And then I must say a lot of it was also by word of mouth. People mm -hmm. that listened to, whether listened to gay wire or they read it somewhere else that would tell about things uh, about it as well. Um, nothing as sophisticated as we have these days. Yeah, and so like bulletin boards in the bars yeah. uh, or um, posters up for events, absolutely. The Roost was a good source, yeah. yeah. Um, um, our friend Larry Jewell's not here, but Larry's told me before about, um, I, hope, I, I think this is okay story to share about um, being going to, a, in the late 60s, going to a, uh, a bar on White Ave in Edmonton and somebody had written in graffiti, where do guys meet other guys? And somebody else had answered. <laughs> And so it was a hotel bar downtown. And so like Larry went there and tried to figure out which table or like which area. So graffiti um, might have been a way. Um, we, we had, uh, I mentioned the support group that we had running in cameras. And our big thing was a little tiny classified ad that ran for two years. And it drew a lot of people. And I was, you know, I got to say, I was really happy that the cameras Canadian at least allowed us that much because that was a big thing. People would read it and come. Was it right written in, in code or was it direct? Oh, Do you remember? No. Uh, it was not in code. It was uh, the Gay and Lesbian Support Group of Camrose, da da da. And uh, we had a box number and people would write, le write letters. And it was a really interesting um, scene because a lot of them were, you know, a lot of people were professional people in cameras and they were terrified absolutely terrified they would come to our house and they would be you could see the whites of their eyes they were so frightened but over the course of two years we developed a really strong group but um i was pleased after i left gaywire and got into audiovisual communications that we did have a cable tv show of our very own and we are allowed we put on the words big letters gay and lesbian so yeah full circle <laughs> another thing maybe later 90s early 2000s was there was on access and then i think shaw um there was like home 
uh, homework hotline, help hotline, some of those shows. And, and I know I and some others did those, which was like a call in. Uh, people could call in looking for help with their homework, but also help with different social issues. So mm -hmm. there'd be like um, somebody from the AIDS network or HIV Edmonton, somebody from what was then Planned Parenthood. Um, so some, some of those pieces as well. What were some of the other ways that you accessed information? Um, making non-dating connections on Plenty of Fish. Oh, really interesting. Um, so somebody invited to a Women's Space event. Um, word, word of mouth. The Women's Space newsletter was a real treasure, wasn't it? Um, there's a, if people are interested in history, there's a really interesting history of women's space that was published, uh, it was published as like a PhD thesis. Um, it's fascinating. And one of my favorite things about it is this story about this household that learned that they, this lesbian household that learned that they were under police surveillance um, in, I think, 1981. And the way they found out is that it, 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 it's hinted that a lesbian working at the phone company let them know. And um, the household was um, somebody who was um, a communist, somebody who was involved in trade, trade union politics and a lesbian. And they were like, it might be her, it might be me. I don't know, they're surveilling us. Like it was just this great anecdote that was just like, you know, we're all enemies of the state. It could be anything. Um, so I really like that. Um, okay, and um, one of the other things when we're thinking about sort of ways that we get information and communicate information um, is, you know, how do we, um, how do we meet people before, uh, before um, internet? I think that like, and I think this might, these might not be shocking conversations in these places, but I find that when I talk to younger people and I teach at McEwen, um, I teach a course about gender and sexuality at McEwen, when I say before internet, that like that is before the lifetime of my almost all of my students, and it really is unimaginable. I think that this is such a um, fundamental difference in um, people who came up um, before or in the early days of internet and and afterwards. The internet came available in my last year of university to give a, a sense of where I fall in that, and I thought it was a stupid gimmick that would never catch on. So never take invest, investing advice from me, um, you know, never, never, uh, I'm not your financial advisor. Um, are there any um, memories that other people have about early, like, zines or magazines or gay wire or other radio in other towns? Because it's something that exists in college radio in a lot of places. Uh, I see there, there's a comment about the Women's Space News uh, articles or letters that I wrote. Uh, um, that was a fun time for about from the year 2000 to 2018, I believe I wrote an article uh, in the Women's Space Newsletters, uh, provided uh, pictures as well, uh, original photographs and just talking about funny situations. And that was kind of a favorite, favorite thing that I've done in the past. And um, I don't know if it'll happen, but they're supposed to be archived in the City of Edmonton archives for future use and perhaps even be coming on display sometime in the museum. So I could be famous. I don't know. <laughs> I think that things like Women's Space gave and, and other publications just gave a sense of like having culture and yeah. learning, learning cultural norms and learning yeah. how do people talk about their relationships, who are people listening to and, um, you know, that there was, there was, I, I definitely had a really big sense of, of that, of trying to glean like social norms and trying to figure out, you know, if I had the guts to go to a place, what would the place be? Um, 
you talked about those people writing letters. One of my other early experiences was I was involved in the University of Alberta um, organization, which is called Outreach Now, but was called Gay Lock then, Gays and Lesbians on Campus. And you would do, at the start of the meeting, you would, one of the people's responsibility would be to go check the benches outside of Athabasca Hall, because there would be somebody sitting there too afraid to go in by themselves. And that that was just a like the a normal part of the meeting was who's going to check the benches, um, who's going to check for somebody looking for directions and not looking at the building and, um, you know, and invite them to come in and say that it was okay and offer to sit next to them and, you know, to sort of have some of that opportunity for connection. Such a scary time. I'm curious now you're working still in the field, Christy, like, do you get a sense that people are still freaked out about it or afraid to come out or, you know, it seems like I see everywhere support groups and gay youth and, you know, it's, they seem to be really involved. So I'm curious, it seems better. I don't know, but are people still afraid to come out? Yeah. <laughs> in a word yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean I think I think different experiences I think that um you know particularly for folks whose um whose families are religious in in certain spiritual traditions who are evangelical or catholic um for example um you know depending on the social culture of the communities that people are are coming up and, and out into um you know, I think for a lot of people, it has become much safer to be gay or lesbian and still remains um, desperately unsafe to be trans and non-binary. And um, and that some of, you know, there's sort of this idea that rights will be like a trickle down situation, like that something getting safer for one person will mean that it gets safer for somebody else. But that isn't necessarily the case. Um, so sometimes people have developed like a, they've come to include gay or lesbian in their okay category, but they're still actively discriminating against people who are trans. Mm -hmm. And and my hope is that people who are uh, gay or lesbian will consider this to be our issue um, and consider this to be a value that we take to heart and that we open doors around. Um, and I don't know if that's always the case, but I always hope it will be um, that we don't just sort of say, oh, well, now I'm in the club. Um, but we uh, we say the club's not big enough. The family picture is um, insufficient. We need to broaden that. It's a bias that I have. Well, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because you never really stop coming out. I mean, just the other day I was walking out here and uh, a neighbor stopped by and, you know, asked me a little bit about my past because I've sort of just showed up in this community and... So, you know, there was a pause in my mind, like, do I, do I say it? <laughs> uh, you know, so I did. I talked openly about being lesbian. So the word's out now. So <laughs> if you never see me again, you know, it didn't go well. <laughs> it's, it's funny. I, I was going to say, I have this really funny thing that happened. I'd been doing gay work for about five years. So I'm a femme. I've always been pretty femme presenting, which hasn't always been the predominant um, stereotypical lesbian appearance, maybe. Um, and uh, about five years into doing Gay Wire, someone asked me, a lesbian who was connected to the show or a friend of the show, asked me um, why I did Gay Wire as a fag hag was the term she used. And I was like, and I was like, oh, okay, I don't get called that very often. So interesting. And then, uh, and then I was like, no, there is no allyship enough for the pain of doing this show. Like sometimes the show was really hard to do. Sometimes it was a real pain in the ass. You know, I paid for parking at the university 600 times. Like um, sometimes there was nothing to do. Often people had to cancel, you know? And so I just remember the idea that there could be allyship rich enough that you would host gay <laughs> It was like, that doesn't exist. That's a fiction. And it was so weird to me because I felt so out. Like I felt so deeply out. It felt sometimes so risky. Um, I uh, I was one of the first hosts, I think, who used my full name um, on the radio. I think, yeah. Um, like it was much more common only to use first names. And I remember that that meant I was using my dad's last name. And my dad, some of you might have met him. Um, he was an okay, you know, he was a good enough, good enough man. Michael, I think Michael met my dad at my wedding. Um, 
Uh, my dad had a really hard time uh, having a daughter who was queer. Uh, he, he came from a deeply homophobic social culture uh, that was a real slow incline um, in our lives. Um, it got betterish, you know, that, that's, that's our success story. Um, but, uh, um, but I remember that awareness and, and thinking about, should I use a name that is not my dad's last name? Is this going to be safe? Like that was something that I was really, really aware of at a time when there were no employment protections. Um, you know, um, would there be danger from having your name in public? Uh, felt like a real concern. Well, um, using my name was the only reason actually we got to run the support group because you no, know, we needed a name for people to, you know, like we had professional people even referring people to us. So I did very early on decide, screw it, I'm using my name. And, you know, I never looked back, but that was a big thing because I realized over my uh, years on this journey, it's not a common thing. A lot of people do not want their names mentioned and are, are still afraid, so. And, and rightly so. Like, I think that I also There's really respect that. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, so I, if I you have such wonderful chemistry, no wonder you had such a successful <laughs> tag team radio show. <laughs> it's yeah. so wonderful to watch you watch you go back and forth. Uh, we have a little less than 15 minutes left. Should we open it up to the participants in case that there are some questions that they want oh, to yeah. ask? There's oh, yeah, people. absolutely. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have a question? Maybe you could either use the chat box or you could uh, raise your hand with the reactions and we'll, uh, we'll get to you. <laughs> Eric, I see you have your hand up. Please, please go ahead. Just two quick things. One is that the joy of accidentally stumbling across some information pre-internet. Uh, I remember the first time I heard gay wire, I thought, holy cow, <laughs> you know, and then stumbling across the Times 10 magazine or stumbling across something else. That was the first thing. But the second was um, when I started volunteering at the Pride Center, which was, I don't remember what it was called at the time, but it was on the third floor on 106th Street. And I would only ever use my first name. And even using my first name, I was a little bit concerned because Eric's not that usual a name. So I congratulate you for the pro, you know, how um, strong you were to use your, your full names because that was, it was many, many years before I would actually say Eric's story. And I was very uh, nervous about using Eric. So that was all. Just thanks very much. Thank you, Eric. Anyone else have a comment or a question? And uh, this is Deirdre. I don't know how to raise my hand. What do I do to raise my hand? Oh, why don't you go ahead? You have the floor now. Please, please go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I just really wanted to say uh, to all of you, this is wonderful. And I have so many memories of Gay Wire over the years and having heard the interview of Joan's children. And also I learned so much from Christy and continue to learn of course, and from Joan and from Michael and others. Um, I just have the most tremendous respect. So thank you. That's all I want to say. Well, thank you. That's awesome. Thanks Deirdre. Thank you, Deirdre. Michael. Uh, thanks. Um, um, I do have a question. I, I was going to say, uh, uh, Christy, I did use my name, but I never spelt it because no one could tell when I said fair what, you know, no, no one expected it. it was spelt the way it was till I went into politics and then I had no choice because I had to recognize it on the ballot. <laughs> in that. Um, but my, my question is, um, was there any um, uh, uh, public, pu not public, but any polling done on, on, on readership, uh, uh, sorry, listening ship, I should say, on, on uh, your program or any of the others on at that time? Kind of Not the, I, mean, really. I know you said whether wonder whether anybody was listening. I, I remember those days on some of that those kinds of things as well. But I just yeah. wonder was there anything that 
that you recall of, of any kind of um, uh, evaluation, not evaluation, but but looking at leadership, uh, lead, uh, sorry, listenership? Not really. Um, there might have been sort of in later years, um, you know, I can say that Gatewire was always really successful in the fund drive, was um, really, was really nurtured by CJSR, like it was a six o'clock, Thursdays at six, um, was a good time slot, you know, we could have been, I had colleagues, I, I would, I, whenever I would, I would go anywhere, I would go to the radio show and meet people and talk about their shows, and so there were a lot of places where it was on at 10 at night, and so um, being on at six, being on during the drive home time, felt really meaningful and it was kind of a news slot for a number of years um, on like if you looked at the schedule it'd be a bit of a news slot um, so, but it was always really uh, protected by CJSR. I will say one time when I got into some conflict with the management at CJSR was they decided they were going to turn it into a call-in show. There was a new news director, they had great ideas, they were going to turn it into a call-in show. I'm allergic to call-in shows. I can't stand them. It, the the like waiting for what the next person's gonna think. I I like a carefully vetted environment, and so um, so that was something that I was like, I have a nice show. I'm I just said I would walk, um, because it was yeah. And and the other thing I think it's important to know is that Gay Wire, like most of the stuff that we do in the world, is a volunteer um thing. So everybody who did that work that was always uh, volunteer. Um. Just a quick thing, I don't want to take the time of questions, but um, the, the pressure around coming out, uh, so I'm a, I work now, I teach at McEwen part-time, but I work, work as a therapist, and one of the decisions I had when I started to set up my therapy practice was, um, how do you present yourself? And it was really interesting, because some of the feedback I got was just be, say you're an ally, um, and that isn't, like, I don't I actually... I, I do work with some folks who are not in the community, but not that many. Usually they have a relative in the community. Almost everybody I work with is, is, uh, is in the community. And, and it's funny, somebody called me the other day and said, I said, how did you hear about me? And she said, I wanted, she said, honestly, what I want is a therapist I can complain to about the trucker convoys. And I felt like you were a safe bet. And I was <laughs> like, bring it on, like, bring it on my friend. Sure. Yeah. And so I thought like, you know, that there are, there are reasons why we show ourselves um, and we make ourselves visible to each other. And that, may, that, might, so that might narrow our audience, but also then we are able to see each other and that's important. Thank, thanks. Thank you, Michael. Uh, does anyone else have a question or a comment? Uh, there's some comments in, oh, I'm sorry, Robert, please go ahead. Um, if there were more comments, I, I wouldn't waste the time with this, but uh, off topic, but when you mentioned your uh, program aired on Thursdays, that brought me right back to high school, where you didn't wear red on Thursdays, because if you wore red on Thursdays, that meant you were queer. Mm -hmm. And I haven't thought of that for decades, but, um, but it's buried in there somewhere. There was a, Go there was a was lesbian gonna... one about green. Was it green on Tuesdays? Does anybody know? That we would, then you would be a lesbian. It's so funny, these, these things. Thank you for that, Robert. That's interesting. Keep going. Well, and, and I remember once somebody, it may have depended on the community. I went to high school in Montreal, so it might have been different elsewhere. Somebody said, oh, in my high school, it was yellow on Wednesdays. And, uh, but, but you know, you know, there had to be that little thing in there just to, uh, I don't know poke the bear, right? And the bear was hibernating in a cave. So I don't know that there was much choice and uh, uh, need to, to poke it. I, your session was absolutely delightful. I've uh, never lived in Edmonton, so I've never heard the program. Uh, was great hearing about the history. And I've really enjoyed the back and forth um, in this group, uh, particularly today has been uh, just a great experience. Thank you, Robert. There's a few uh, comments in the chat. So Allison says, "Ah, what a meaningful thing when someone would go and get people who were nervous to come in. Um, Deirdre says, amazing courage, Christy and Joan. Uh, Mary says, this was so wonderful and engaging. And Laura says, thank you so much for all your hard work and courage, Christy and Joan. 
And, and Deirdre says a big appreciative shout out to all the amazing courageous woman space board members who did so much for our community over the years. Won't mention names here, but would like to express much appreciation and respect. Well, Deirdre, thank you. Maybe that's a topic we should have a, a, at a future Aging with Pride session. We can certainly follow up on that. And, and the boards of the court and the boards of Clicky and Gate and the Pride Center. I mean, the volunteer, I mean, uh, um, uh, this is not what we're talking about today, but I was the first ever paid staff member of Glicky. I worked there part time in 1998. Um, and, uh, and it had operated for 17 years, purely by volunteers at that point. And has always run with the majority of its work being done by volunteers. And so, you know, that there are always these, um, these, you know, folks who are doing great work behind the scenes and, um, and these organizations couldn't run without them. It's so important. Uh, Robert, uh, Robert got the earrings. So uh, my recollection of one of the rules was gay is right and right is wrong. That's how you knew how to wear your earring. Um, and uh, if you only wore one, and Robert says um, that um, he would make sure that his earring was in the left ear only. That's, that's all of these codes for invisibility. And yeah. Different kind of handkerchiefs that you wore in your back pocket for a minute. Yeah. We have a comment um, from Allison. She says, for this Zoom, I'm an on call for work and can only be auditing and sporadic comments. However, after experiencing the past two years of high volume of college and work Zooms, thank you all for sharing your voices and words here. There's such a silence in my world for 2S LGBTQ+, so my brain is thankful. I did that without reading glasses, you know. That's good, very good. Does anyone else have any comments or, or questions? We have about five minutes left. Hi, this um, is Deirdre again. May I speak again? Please go ahead, Deirdre. Thank you. You know, uh, there was uh, there were very exciting things that happened within the university context, within the intellectual community there. And for a long time, there was quite um, a difference between those uh, women or, or intellectual people who were associated with the community within that context and the people on the street, you know, like moi. And I just think that it's fabulous that more and more um, integration has happened. And I have a question. Uh, I'll, I'll address it to Joan and to Christy. Um, I know Christy has heard me ask this question before in a different context, but do you think that bisexual women are still treated with a bit of um, caution within the lesbian community? Um, that's a good question. I, at one time, you know, would, could be or was considered bisexual. I was married, but I still had, you know, feelings for women. I think, uh, though, in a futuristic world, uh, that that label could fit because it means fluidity. You know, you're you're not really stuck on any one gender, but you're open to a relationship with someone. So. You know, I've I've come to value that label, if you want to call it a little bit differently. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that um, I wish that we didn't discriminate. I wish that um, lesbian and gay people didn't discriminate uh, based on bisexuality or biphobia, based on being trans. Um, I wish we were never racist, you know, that's, if I could design the dream, that's the dream for me. Um, yeah, you know, I have a lover who is bi, and I think that um, she would probably say that there are people who are cautious um, with, um, with that, and I think that, that, I mean, I, but I think that there's also some generational Maybe it's a generational difference, or maybe it's more vocal among folks who are a little bit younger, where there's a lot of just really blowing up the categories, which I find kind of neat and exciting, um, where people are finding really interesting new ways to express um, to express their gender, to 
express their gender expression, to sort of name who they are, um, and to develop identities around flags and different um, different identities. And so sometimes people feel a bit threatened by that. Um, that that isn't my reaction. I I find it really exciting, and and I find it I I find I learn a lot when I ask when somebody says I identify this way, and I can like put down my ego and say tell me more, I don't know about that. Or what I know, somebody asked me, do you know about this recently? And I said, I think that what I know might be actually not very informative. I think what I know might be based on stereotypes. Can you tell me uh, what that means to you? And that's a great conversation. We're down to our last couple of minutes and I think we should give the last words to Joan and to Christy. Joan, any final words for us today? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for showing up everybody i was like scared to death to do this but uh i think you know the labels are going to go away one day and it won't matter because there's going to be so many letters in the alphabet will just be the whole alphabet so <laughs> you know we'll, we'll just give up on the concept and it won't matter so that's what i'm going for um, I would like to just end with a thanks. I want to thank Kim for his work on the poster and helping us to market this and for Jan and Eric and the others for organizing. Um, and I, I want you to know that I remember the work that you have done, all of you, the, um, that, we, that the work is still there and that it um, is impacting people. And as the person who's 49, Joan talked about turning 50 and what a moment that was. And that's the moment I live in. Um, and so I'm just deeply, deeply grateful for the path setting and the safety that, um, that my peers and elders have created and that, that uh, the model that you have given us to create for younger people. Um, I remember being in pride organizing meetings when I was the youngest person by 10 years. And, um, uh, and now that is not my life. Um, very often um, I'm around people who are younger than my kid um, a lot of the time when I'm teaching. And so, um, so I, I just, I, I want to say that we're part of a continuum and I'm just so deeply grateful. Um, Blair and Eric and Michael and Alvin and, um, and Jan and, and Joan and, and everyone for the work that um, you have done to make me safer and make me able to use my name. Well, thank you, Joan and Christy. That was just so inspiring. Um, thank you too to Kim Lauren for your technical assistance with this program today. And thank you to all of you for joining us. I hope that we see you next week when Roger Halfrick will perform for us um, on Thursday, March 17th. It should be a nice relaxing day and you can wear green if you wish. And we will be sending you a survey. So please take a moment and fill that out. And now I return the meeting back to our host, Kim. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'll see you all next week. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, everyone. Bye.